Welcome to another episode of Hair Biz Radio with your host, Zakira and Mikey. <laughs> and today we have a special guest with us. His name is David Johnson, and he is the interim CEO of Bronner Brothers. He has a proven track record of uh, doing transformational leadership within companies over the last tons of years, <laughs> but we're going to get into that soon. But before we do welcome our guests, let's just kind of catch up on what's been going on. Mikey, where are we at right now? What's happening? I know you caught me like maybe a week ago, a couple of days ago, excited information, <laughs> exciting information. So what, what's up? You know, I always got something. I know <laughs> I, I'm the king. I was, I forgot. I think I was telling 2.0 who eventually we're going to have on this podcast. 2.0, by the way, is employee number one. So okay. with us today, 10 years later, <laughs> um, how I was like telling him about this new thing. And I said, like, 2.0, if I ever tell you we're not doing like another project again, please slap me. Right. <laughs> you know we're always going to be doing another project. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would like to announce we do have a new centerpiece. We do. For the Hair Biz Radio Studio. This is Shopify sent us this award. This is when you reach 100,000 orders on Shopify. So this is just the- Let's just pause right there. Let it breathe for a second. This How many part, orders? A hundred thousand. Oh, over a hundred thousand. Yeah, we, we actually reached a hundred thousand November fifteenth, twenty twenty two. Wow. So about a year ago, and we mm -hmm. got on Shopify mid twenty nineteen. So that's really this, great. In about you know three years, we did the hundred thousand orders. So the next award they give out very similar to you. It's very YouTube. -ish. I was literally just getting ready yeah. to say. It's very similar to YouTube. Very similar to YouTube is the million. So we got a little ways to go mm -hmm. with that. But thankfully, here at Private Label, we continue to build our partnerships. And, you know, we have people like and companies like Bronner Brothers that we're working right. with that will help continue to let us grow. We will try to do our best to make them grow. So it's it's really right now is a great time to be creating content, yep. creating partnerships, not slowing down. I am very excited that the the writers are getting back to work now that the strike is over. So yeah, I saw that. Ramp up. Yeah, you know the beauty industry. I feel like it hurt a lot of people in the beauty industry. It did. There's a lot of people in beauty. Yeah, there weren't any sets. There were no no sets to be on. Well, there were some, but for the most part, the, everything just kind of ceased. So it definitely took a turn for people who are in the entertainment industry, in the beauty industry, all of those things. And so now everyone's ready to get back to work. But hopefully, while the strike was happening, you were still working and moving, doing things on the back end to push the needle for when business did ramp back up, which we have a podcast about that, where we talked about do not sleep on the off season. The off season is made for you to ramp up business, figure out where your gaps are, start to put systems in place so that when you do have consistent business moving, you're not running around like, oh my God, what do I do next? And trying to keep up, you're ahead of the ball. So exactly. Yeah. Yes. I miss the days of, you know, the showroom, someone in the showroom staff saying, Mikey, someone from Tyler Perry came is for some <laughs> show or this, that, the other, or a movie or, and then yep. you know, movie people contacting me like, Hey, I need some crazy long hair for some creature yeah. for this horror film or <laughs> something like those were cool times. And yeah. Like, and I, I just, where has it gone? And it was the strike. And so, uh, you know, I'm glad they worked everything out and everyone's back to work. You know, I like to work. So yeah. like, let's, <laughs> let's go. We don't have time to, to waste in life We're yes. every single day. Mm -hmm. We got AI coming for us. Uh, no, no, that's seriously. Actually, seriously. David and I had a good conversation about <laughs> it. He, he loves AI too. I think, you know, you got to stay on top of AI. So that'll be like a whole nother, that'll be a great episode as well. When we did talk about doing a, another episode. Yeah, we'll go yes. in a little deeper. But I, you know, we have so much to talk about with Bronner Brothers because, mm -hmm. you know, it, Bronner Brothers, it's funny. I was in the car with David about, it's been like four months or so. And I'm talking about Brown and Brown and he looks at me. He's like, you know, he was just somewhat not amazed, but kind of taken back with like how highly I speak about Browner brothers. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that, you know, we've had some really good shows at Browner brothers. We've had some really bad shows, but mm -hmm. guess what? That's what happens. Like yeah. you learn from the bad shows and everything else, but he was so surprised about how excited I was about Browner brothers and working with Browner brothers. I just feel like Browner brothers, is the glue to our industry. Definitely. So it's it been is around from, for forever. It's <laughs> 70, was 76 years now, 77, 77, yeah. 77th year. So like for me, the industry needs a glue. We do our best to build community within the industry, right. but we're still, you know, we're still small. Yeah. So having Bronner brothers that is legendary in the industry and has, has taken it so far. It's so amazing. And it's great to have some new fresh blood 
which we're going to get into in it to make sure that we are continuing to push forward. And Broader Brothers is making the necessary changes as technology, life, yeah. the way people do things, mm-hmm. social media changes. I, I And right off the bat, whatever you guys are doing with your social media, it looks great. The videos and all the content that's been pushed out is literally within the last, make sure you guys go to Bronner Brothers uh, YouTube, or uh, Bronner Brothers Instagram and Facebook page. The content they put out in the last three, four, three months probably is literally 100X what it was <laughs> before. Um, no exaggeration. Go check out their videos and their content. It is really awesome. So I'm excited to see these changes. Yes. And Thank so you we, so much. We're working hard. <laughs> yes, we know. And Dave's on. He's on them too. Uh, yes. <laughs> Little birdies. You know, this guy is, this guy's pushing everyone, which is what you need to do. Definitely. And you mentioned partnerships, which I think is very important when it comes to business, building businesses. And so David has been with Bronner Brothers for the last nine months. That's right. Nine months. And so he's going to talk to us a little bit about what is your background? I know we talk about transformational leadership within companies, but what does that mean? Sure. So I started my career when I was 19. I wanted to understand how rehabs work. Because unfortunately, I had had some friends and family members who had had substance abuse problems. Started out as a research project. I'm in college. I thought maybe I could get an independent study. And it quickly became an obsession. And that obsession and research project became a business. And that was my first business. I worked on it for five years. It was called Paranade. Horrible name. <laughs> I learned How'd you come up with the name? I want to tell parents. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to write a business plan. I learned how to pitch investors. I learned how to work with customers. It was a great experience. But what I realized a little late in my process, and many first-time entrepreneurs have this experience, unfortunately, but it's part of the journey. Mm -hmm. I realized a little late that while I had 80% of the uh, product market fit I needed, I was going after the wrong payers. Mm. While parents were my logical customers, insurance companies should have been my payers and not parents. And when I realized I had made that mistake, I saw that I couldn't get out of it. I could have a future where I would have a boutique business advising parents almost as an educational consultant, or I could stop. I was in my early 20s. I saw that it wasn't going where I wanted to go. I chalked it up to experience. I, um, I walked away. It was painful, but it was a great lesson. And from that day on, I wanted to understand what do you do when a business has made a mistake? Mm. What do you do when a business has made a wrong turn? Let's pause right there for a second. So you said when a business makes a mistake or makes a wrong turn. Absolutely. How out of 100 percent, how often do businesses get stuck right there? So a lot of businesses get stuck. And um, one of my favorite things to look at is if you read closely the stories of even some of the biggest successes, Mm -hmm. you will see, and it has a lot of gloss over after a few years, but you'll see incidents and moments where it's like, oh, that was, that was kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you mean cash was tight for a year? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean that the CEO went to the blackjack tables to make payroll? Oh, that was a problem. So a lot of successful companies have a moment or more. Mm -hmm. It's normal. And I love that you said that because a lot of times, even in this industry, the beauty industry, we'll have people say, well, it's been six months or one year and I haven't made my first sale yet. Or um, the business is moving very slow or how now the industry just came to a halt. Right. Or a slight halt because of everything that was um, happening. So it's like you have to understand and know that things are going to happen. Right business can and will slow down and it's not just you being singled out it's literally inevitable (laughs) it's part of the journey it's part of the evolution of business there are going to be ebbs and flows and there are going to be moments where you're selling everything you can but you don't have quite as much cash as you thought you were going to Mm -hmm. that happens to a lot of businesses too yeah but um i i completely agree there there's definitely it's not a straight up and to the right line never is yeah that would be too easy. Yeah. That's, that's not the journey. That's not like, yeah, it's what would we learn from that? 
Of course. You know, as soon as when you when you said you walked away from your first business, it reminded me of when I walked from my first business. And I just chalked it up as education. Right. And that was some of the best education I've ever had still to this day. How in my easy life. was that? To walk away. How easy was it to chalk it up to education after everything you had built, after everything you did? <laughs> well, when I, when I was going through it, it was not too easy. Yeah. It's totally, it's <laughs> but afterwards, when you create success yeah. and then you realize a lot of that success was created from your failure, mm -hmm. then you're like, Oh, it's okay to fail. Yeah. So it happened after you saw success, not necessarily while you were in the journey. Oh, for learning. sure. I wasn't yeah. like, you know, holy cow, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. You know, it's like, oh, well, I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you know, you're not really thinking about it, then, but it's, it's normal. It happens to it, some of the greatest businesses yeah. that have gone through those issues and it's just part of the game. Definitely. So you started, you had the business early 20s. It wasn't looking too good for you. Right. Um, and where did you go from there? So uh, I'm originally from New Jersey, as we had shared before. Yeah. We have that in common. Um, it was the early 2000s. Analytics was not cool. Mm -hmm. No one was talking about data science. But I really liked databases and um doing analytic work. So I went into the R&D departments of a series of pharmaceutical companies, did data analytics for about two and a half, three years mm -hmm. um, while I was getting ready to go to grad school. Got into business school. Business school took me to Chicago. And within a month, I got introduced to an industry that I knew nothing about, which is the industry that I've been in ever since, the turnaround industry, people who fix companies for a living. And from the moment that I realized that that was a thing that people could do, yeah. I haven't wanted to do anything else. Nice. So I just steered my way into that, and that's where I've made my home and made my career. So you are a fixer. That I is what you fixer. do. That is what I do. <laughs> so can you talk to us a little bit about some of the companies that you have gone in? I mean, maybe if you need to leave names out, you can, but just some, some of the things that you have accomplished throughout your career. Absolutely. One of the things that I love about what I do, and um, now because my industry is... There aren't a ton of people who do it, but there are certainly a lot of approaches to it. My approach is I look at myself as a subject matter expert in change and business transformation. So I don't focus on, I'm not about a particular industry. I'm about the situation. We recognize that change is needed. Mm -hmm. And generally I work with companies that are between 10 and 400 million in revenue because at that size you can leverage off your partners mm -hmm. and your internal team for the industry knowledge. And I can layer on top of that my subject matter expertise in change. So I have I have fixed a little bit of everything. I've fixed independent energy companies and timeshare companies. I fixed two social service agencies, both over a hundred years old, one of which is celebrating its hundred fiftieth anniversary this year. Nice. And it would not have made that if it weren't for me. Um, I have, this is my second tour in the ethnic hair care industry, which mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll talk about in yeah. a little bit. I've touched a lot of spaces. I have been in a consulting or interim leadership role in over 50 companies. I've also been on a dozen boards. I sit on five currently. So I devote all of my professional time and energy into thought leadership in the space speaking and writing into um, my day-to-day -day role as an interim leader, focusing on transform transformational leadership, being a change agent at the board level, being a change agent as an investor. And that's really where I've, again, made my career and made my home. I love it. Um, as you were talking, it just reminded me of the movie uh, Taken, <laughs> where he says, um, I have a very special set of skills <laughs> and I'm going to find you and I will kill you. <laughs> and so basically what you do is you have a very special set of skills and you die, kill off everything that is not making um, the business work That's and right. you literally fix things. And so I love that. And so when we talk about, did you want to jump in there? I feel like you're about no, to I say just, something. I, okay. I love that analogy yeah. right there. Like, in the middle of a movie here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm never going to watch Taken the same. I'm going to see this guy. You know? It's in businesses. Yeah, and I love it. I feel like you need those sometimes. One thing my dad always says, which 
sticks with me is what got you here won't get you there. So whatever you use to build the business, the tools and uh, the systems that you've put in place to get you to a certain peak of your business or career um, can sustain you, but it won't get you to that next level with where you need to be. That's and so right. you come in and you're literally giving fresh ideas, fresh new systems, filling in the gaps, filling in the buckets to where people need to actually move the needle. And so we talk about the hair industry and I'm sure Mikey can go into kind of what have been some of the um, dips and some of the twists and turns just as an industry as a whole. And then we can kind of segue into um, David's success with it. Yeah. The, the industry's, you know, it's been great to us and we've had a great run in the industry mm -hmm. and we're going to keep running for a long time. It's yeah. funny because it's interesting when a business, when you've been in business for a while, and I understand the position of where David comes in because people ask me all the time, wow, you've been doing that for a long time. Aren't you bored? <laughs> and I'm definitely the kind of person where I understand the business is not going to continue to work today. What it is today in five years, it's going to be different. Yeah. Right. You take the strengths and what's working, you double down on those, but then you have to continue to innovate. Yeah. And especially with what's going on today with, I think change, change happens much more rapidly today than it ever has in history. Mm -hmm. So even with business, it's like this new social platform. Okay. Is this going to be a thing or not? Do we need to spend time on this or not? Yeah. You know, the way we do the content and, you know, I've been spending the last few months really working on our content generation strategies because content is still and will continue to be so important for your business. Yeah. So we're really doubling down on how to do that. So it's interesting to see, you know, I talked about the social media, like Broader Brothers has so much content, but they were doing a really bad job, honestly, of getting it out there. Yeah. Which, you know, I had conversations with people about, I'm like, where are all the video? Like, I see the cameras there. Like, <laughs> where are all these, are you guys holding these hostage? <laughs> like, what's going on here? Because I'm like, this needs to be. This needs to be out there. People need to see. I, you know, the Netflix special. Did you watch the Netflix special? Absolutely. So you saw the Netflix special. Did you see the Netflix I special? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously Dallas was a part of the Netflix special. Yeah. So I was hyped up obviously <laughs> to see Dallas and for other reasons. And I thought that was a really interesting take on the show because people got to see a little bit behind the scenes. Yeah. They got to see the hair battle, which is this very dramatic, exciting, high energy event, you know, which is amazing. And so people that aren't in the industry have no idea. We're probably watching this thing like, holy, <laughs> what? Somebody's spinning and cutting hair upside down. <laughs> We're like, they don't do that at great clips for $12. You know? <laughs> so it's just interesting. I'm excited to see where Bronner Brothers is going to go with the industry because I know it's a blessing and a curse, the 77 years of like, we've been doing things. We were successful for so long. Mm -hmm. COVID hits. When you're talking like getting blindsided, who was ready yeah. for that in the in the event industry? Right. Holy, you're talking pumping the brakes. Yeah. So standing on them. Yeah. yeah. Full yeah. stop. Full stop, guys. You know, I know they tried the virtual event, yep. which yeah. I don't think was a huge success. I don't you know, I don't know for sure. I don't really ask because I was like, I don't know how, you know, Your this things is, are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah like it's, it's one of it's, it's hard to do virtual for something like that type yeah. of event. You can't bring the magic. You so can't. for sure, you know, part of broader brothers is you're walking in and it's, you know, it's you, an experience, it's this experience. Yeah. It's this big event. You have all these people, people are dressing, you know, they get dressed. Some people mm -hmm. get really dressed up. Yeah. The hairdos, the, the loud music, the people on stage like Dallas yeah. talking yeah. and uh, Britannica. And you've seen so many great people in the industry for all these years. That's like the, energy it's you can't recreate that online no you can see a little bit to get excited to know where you need to be sure but it's not it so let's dive into what are we looking at what are some of the key changes and experience that is going to bring us to 2023 2024 for this upcoming show yeah well thank you that's a that's a great lead in i would say the biggest thing for what I do and the way I approach every new situation, but especially at Bronner Brothers, is to walk with humility. At the end of the day, most of the good ideas aren't going to be mine because most of the ideas are out there. So I spend time talking to partners like you. I spend time talking to um, employees. I 
go to as many competitor events as I can. What's out there? What's floating around? 80 to 85% of the answer is already out there. My job is to synthesize that. My job is to start prioritizing that and putting it in order and making sure that I have or am creating a team that can execute on a logical set of steps once we've identified, okay, these are the things we want to do. This is where we want to go. And what I see in the industry is there are beautiful shows that have a sprinkling of a multicultural element as an afterthought. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. They're, they're not exclusionary in any sense, but they're not targeting that. I feel like Bronner Brothers' new lane is not to be a black hair show, but to be a multicultural beauty show where our products, we're going to have a booth, we're going to feature our products, but I want to feature everyone's products. I want black and brown beauty professionals and beauty enthusiasts to know that Bronner Brothers shows are going to be a place that you can come to see what's new and exciting in our industry, to learn about technical skills and business skills, to move your business forward, to network with your peers, to make connections. And I feel like if I can execute on that, we will have solidified a new place for ourselves. Our future isn't being a flea market. We've gone as far down that road as we can. And we need to stop. We need to turn around and recognize that we've hit a dead end or a cul-de-sac And now it's time to recreate ourselves in a vision of what this industry needs moving forward. And what it needs is more connective tissue. Mikey, you talked about partnerships. I absolutely agree with you. And while we're certainly not the first ones to see it, I think in the multicultural beauty space, there's still a paucity of partnerships. It's still people aren't connecting as much as they need to. They're not thinking as hard as they need to about, you know, what is the person down the street doing? What is someone in Birmingham doing that I'm not? What are the best practices? Because when we do that, we lift all of ourselves up. There's so much opportunity and so much innovation in beauty, but we're not doing a good enough job cross-pollinating. And if we continue to fail in that, then the wealth that's created is not going to stay in the minds or the pockets of the creators it's going to be it's going to be taken over by outsiders that took the time to read the market make the changes that they needed to recognize that they're business people as well as artisans and stuck that landing and i think Bronner brothers has a place in creating the foundation, the platform to make sure that more of the wealth that's being created Mm -hmm. by um, the multicultural beauty community stays in the multicultural beauty community. Let's pull more money in rather than all of our success stories are people going up and out. Right. Yeah, and um, I have a question for you. So we talk about, um, even in the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where um, the son is continuing on in the family business. And then you have Gary Vaynerchuk, who um, grew up in the family business. Then you have the Rockefellers. And then you have Bronner Brothers, Chick-fil-A, Bronner Brothers. And so they've created uh, literally generational wealth for the family. The business has been in the family for over 70 years. Right. And so um, you coming in as a fixer, the interim CEO, you're coming into this family-built business. Did you feel any pressure Um, coming into something that was literally built for generations and then having to go in and change the systems that were already kind of set up? You know, there's always a certain amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. I recognize that I am meeting people in what might be the worst year of their professional lives. And again, I always try to walk with humility in that. I am tasked with the extraordinary obligation of fixing a business and when there's so much history, when there's so much hope and emotional investment of a family. Mm -hmm. These family businesses are their own beast. Mm -hmm. That's added pressure. But I'll tell you, the family has been wonderful. 
in my first week, three of the owners of the um, three of the shareholders, the all of the shareholders of the family right now are sons of um, N. H. Brauner, mm -hmm. one of the founders. So I asked for the resignation of the three shareholders that had a job in my first week, and I got it. And I also fired half the company mm. in my first week. I didn't get into this work to fire people who look like my grandmother. I yeah. promise you I didn't. <laughs> but I'll do what needs to be done to fix a business. And asking for the resignation of the owners sent a signal that continues to reverberate around. I still have meetings with partners, and I'll let them know that that was what my first week looked like, and they know I'm serious. Mm, I never had sweet. an issue in a single town hall with our team about like, are, are we really making change or is this lip service? No, this is clearly not lip service. So yes, there's always a wait, but I think that's also an opportunity. The severity of the issue is also uh, in some ways reflective of the size of the opportunity because people get engaged about, hey, look, we're, we're serious. We really get to change things. Right. Bring your best ideas forward. And that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. I love that. And so going into the next Browner Brothers Hair Show, which is February? February is it? 24th through 26th okay. in Atlanta. In Atlanta. So for that next show, I'm sure that we'll be able to see some of the changes. Absolutely. And, okay, what are some of the things? I know you just talked about it being more of a multi multicultural um, experience. But what are some of the back-end things that will be kind of created and presented on display at the February show? So I know that we are investing in ensuring that we're a lot more purposeful with our floor. In mm -hmm. the past, our, we have been heavily skewed toward hair to the point where I think we've actually done a little bit of a disservice to our exhibitors. Mm -hmm. We're going to curate our floor a little bit more. I want to run the gamut of beauty. I don't want it to just be hair. I want nails. I want skin. I want other wellness. I want a good, well-curated mix. I'm also looking and incentivizing exhibitors who are bringing extra pizzazz. I'm looking for more than just um, straight 10 by 10 boxes. Mm -hmm. you know, are, are you willing to invest in something open air? Can you do small, small format classrooms on your floor? Like, Bring me something and let's work together to figure, figure out a way to make that happen. Because when I walk the floor at competitor events, that's what I see. And there's more energy because of that. More things are happening. And, and I was talking to Dallas about this, uh, Mikey, this morning. We've got to treat our main stage like what it is, the most valuable real estate at that show. Yeah. I can't put anyone up on that stage if it is not constantly entertaining and engaging. Am I educating and am I entertaining? I can't have dead air. There has to be a reason that someone is on there and it can never be about filler. So you're going to see a lot more purposeful um, thought into that. And I think you're going to see that we've upgraded our game in terms of education. We're being a lot more rigorous with who gets invited. Unfortunately, that means some people that our wonderful educators didn't get invited back this time, but that's part of the evolutionary process. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to deliver a winning value proposition to everyone who attends and to all of our partners who are making an investment. I want to make sure this is a win-win. I'm so glad Mikey has had good shows. Mm -hmm. I feel awful that he's had bad shows with us. And I want to make sure that the next show is better and that there's a path for the show after that to be even better. If we're growing together, we're going to do a lot of business together. Right. If I lose sight of what makes a good show for Mikey and I just kind of rely on, well, he exhibited last time, I'm going to call him again. That's not a relationship. That's not a partnership. Right. And one day he'll stop answering my call. Yeah, I think that um, it's a treat to have you over at Brown and Brothers because it sounds like that things are moving in the right direction. It sounds like change is happening. It sounds like that the February show literally is going to be a totally different experience from the last was the last show in, uh, in New, Orleans. My New Orleans. But you before that, no, the one in Miami, though. You were in Miami. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So Miami would yeah. have been August of 22. New Orleans was April of 23. Yes. Okay. So it sounds like there will be a different experience yes. from um, those two shows. And then I even remember the last show that was actually in Atlanta. I think it was coming right off of COVID. 20, it was January 20, January, February 2020, right before COVID. Right oh, before, right before right, COVID. Right, right before. Right before it okay. Hit. Yeah. It was right before COVID? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I look forward to um, experiencing a new experience at the show coming in this February. In this February, um, And I know that Mikey has... Are you doing a booth this year? Guys, let's just put him <laughs> off the spot. It's think okay. I, let me get the fixer in here. Uh, I know you've been... I know in Taken they said killing people. I'm gonna, I'm, 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 of course we are going to have... And you know what's funny? It's... It's interesting because he's talking about the dynamic of the booth, and that's something yeah. that I've wanted to revisit yeah. as far as it's important for us to sell hair so people can see hair. But right. another part of our business that has done very well since 2016 is our helping people start a hair business yeah. and our drop shipping business. Right. And by far, we have the most advanced drop shipping system in the hair industry. Definitely. We all, the only hair partner with Shopify, which is the largest e-commerce platform in the world, right? And that was a lot of relationship building and work to get to that point, sure. but also creating great drop shipping product mm -hmm. is, so I want to create based on what we do, because we do our branding, right? So we have the branding, we have private label wholesale, private label, we have our showrooms, we have mm -hmm. a lot going on is I'm trying to reconfigure our booth space and have something that is also focused on the building a business part. Sure. Because one thing I noticed in New Orleans and listening to people coming up to the booth was they heard that we did drop shipping and they were really excited about that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really, I don't believe there was anyone focused on drop shipping at the last two shows. I don't think there was. There, there wasn't. So that could be, I'm always looking at a competitive advantage because obviously there's going to be a ton of people selling hair. Right. Right. And do I want to compete in that space? Yeah, sure. Like, let me get my hands dirty. I don't care. <laughs> but for the drop shipping, people aren't going to invest the money in time to build out what we've built with Shopify. Right. We've seen people in the past try doing this drop shipping model fail miserably because they're not going to put the right systems in place. But that's definitely something. But if other people create more of an interactive environment, because I do know exactly what he's talking about at the shows where it's not just the table. Hey, right. sell. Selling product. Like, hey, come into my space. Let me educate you. Right. Let me show you why we're different. And I think that creates a whole different dynamic instead of you just kind of people. It's like the herd of people walking through the aisles and just everyone's trying to sell them stuff. Right. I do like love the experiences um, when you're walking down the aisle and there are actually people demonstrating or there are tutorials happening or they're actually utilizing their products. They're curling irons there. They have a DJ in their booth or a singer or, you know, just different things. So I do love that experience, but I also understand what you're saying when it comes to like, here you go, cart, 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 here, bye, 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 bye. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you, you know, you get hit up a hundred times, like right. how many cards and other things, mm -hmm. but it's also, for, for it's us, an expo though. It's so, an expo. Yeah. so yeah, you gotta have some of it, you gotta right. have, but I think the people that are really going to win are the ones that create experience experience within yes. their space yes. for the visitors of the show. Yes. The show's going to appreciate that more because it, it's, it's two way street here, right? You have to, I always wanted to make sure I, I'll tell people, don't you think we're shutting down early? I see that other booth. That is not yeah. what you do at a trade show. I've heard you if, say that. Before. You've heard me say yeah. that. I don't care if nobody else comes up to our booth. You have to respect the show. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's really and you frustrating. that floor until the lights go up. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Yeah, we might get out a few minutes or it, sure. what, who cares? We've yeah. been here all weekend anyway. It's <laughs> over, guys. I mean, you're tired. You're, like, it's not going to, it's not going to make a difference in your life, you know, shutting down early. So I think those are some, some key things. So I'm going to try to work. So when you guys come see us at Bronner Brothers, you know, and what is cool about Bronner Brothers, it does bring a lot of people to Atlanta. So over the years yeah. of being there, people are like, oh my God, I've watched you on the podcast. I've seen your videos and I see you in person. You're a mini celebrity for two minutes that you talk to someone, which <laughs> yeah. is cool. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's cool. So I'm yeah, we're we're pumped. So what else what else do we have coming from like a digital aspect at the show? What kind of changes are you guys making for that? You no, know, um, Mikey, I'm I'm a big believer in 
taking and borrowing liberally from what's going on. And frankly, we can learn so much from everything that you're doing. I think that <clears throat> our biggest challenge digitally is to prioritize because we have been so behind in so many. There, There's a, a huge menu of things that we could do. So we're really trying to focus on, okay, can we can we get the website refreshed? How do we load up our social media with more engaging content? Um, YouTube is going to be a fast follow, but I don't think we'll really be cleaned up on YouTube until December or January because we've got so many other things to do. We're focused on having good photo shoots, making sure that we're turn our turnaround time is good, getting that information loaded up onto social media. We're making sure that we are engaging with our partners about how can we best work together to promote the show. Too many times in the past, we have reached out to people, sold a booth, and we don't talk to them again until they show up on the floor. And we've got a great audience. It benefits both of us. Absolutely. It, yeah, that's really engage good. about, hey, what what are you doing that works? You know, this is what we were thinking. And we're having those conversations now and having more of them. And I think that that while that go slow approach can frustrate some of our partners, I would rather go slow with a handful of things that I know I can do well and continue to build capabilities and check in with my partners. Hey, how am I doing? Is this going in the right direction? so I can course correct and try to launch 15 initiatives now and fail at 12 of them in three months. So very focused, let's load up social media, let's make sure we've got good content, let's make sure that content is getting out, let's mine the vault because we've got hundreds of hours, a, a treasure trove of content, and we have not done enough of it. It's stayed in the vault, unedited, and that's just inexcusable. We have got our own history and we haven't we haven't done enough of it so we've got to raid that piggy bank and start sharing that start getting people engaged and when we do that i think that leads to a lot of the other things you're doing some really exciting things that i know we can learn a lot from but we've got to walk before we can run absolutely one of the things that i would like to see browner brothers do and this is from an aspect of if we're all going as vendors to the show mm -hmm. I feel like we're all a team, mm -hmm. whether we're both, you know, I'm selling hair, you're selling hair, whatever. It's not all hair, but you know, I feel like it's a team. What I would like to see Bronner brothers do is because marketing for me in our side, that's, that's how we became successful in this industry. Right. We're just really good at marketing. It doesn't matter what the product is, but we chose hair, right? But we obviously love hair like crazy. <laughs> I would like to see something that Bronner brothers can do. And I think this is easy to do at scale that gets more people that are going to be at the show to promote they're going to be at the show. And that could be as simple as, hey, guys, every month we're going to send you this. You know, you can do it in Canva and you can just I was out the literally photos. just thinking of that. Yeah, I was literally going to say that. <laughs> change out some of the information. And it's like, everybody on this day, please post this. And it's like someone's feed if all the different businesses, because it's a lot of businesses show up here. You see it because you see it once, it's not going to make that same impact. Yeah. But if on the first of the month, you have everyone posting that, hey, I'm going to be at Browner Brothers, come see me. This is going to be great, blah, 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 could be pretty exciting. Yeah. I think I would love to see Browner Brothers utilize strength in numbers and the relationships. So to remind the brands to promote that they're going to be there. I've been posting in the face, I've posted my Facebook group, which is where we have, you know, a pretty uh, solid following. You know, we'll do the stuff on the Instagram and whatnot, but we all need to work together. Right. You know, some people, wow, I don't want people to think like, you know, they might see this other hair company there, da, da, da. Step up your game. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that simple. Yeah. You know, we're all competing. All hair companies are competing with hair companies and the manufacturers in China that yeah. are now dealing direct to consumer. Right. Like even us get kind of pushed out. And there's a lot of those that are actually at Browner Brothers now that we've seen. Of course. A lot. Yeah. You know, and it's not as easy for our people from China or other countries to come here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult. You yeah. know, I'll be in China in two weeks. And luckily I have my visa, but I've been working to get like a visa for some partners that I was going to take with me and show the countryside and yeah. the manufacturing process. 
And it's like, man, they keep rejecting little things. And I'm like, I don't know if they're going to make it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is one of the, it's, it's not easy anymore. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting. So I think a collective effort, we all work together. We can cr- continue to create something special. I think we everyone needs to be all in if you're a vendor there to help promote the show. Yeah, that's right. What are what are some things that people can look forward to for a private label for the February show? I'm still working on it. Okay. <laughs> Coming up with ideas. You know, I think it's, I, I really want to focus on the education component mm-hmm. as much as more than just the selling hair uh, portion. We will have some hair sales and, yeah. we'll, you know, have some deals and whatnot. But I, I really think it's going to be more education focused. So that's going to be really the key, really get your hair business started. It's a great time. You know, the hair industry is slow. So I think when the in, in industry is slow, it's some of the best time to start a business. Yes. It's because it's going to take you time to ramp this thing up anyway. You know, in a slow period, business period, busy period, you're not going to be doing that great anyway. For yeah. the most part, not most people, right? So uh, I think it's going to be more education, definitely focus on experience. And whether it's me sitting somebody down and being like, hey, I'm going to sit here and build your hair brand right here. Right. Because I can do it. It's like, actually a really great idea. I mean, yeah. I can... It, give you a true story. I, I have a trademark coming up for a new brand that we're starting that I'm not telling anybody about. And we're just, it's going to be more celebrity focused. Mm. And so for the trademark, you have to show that you're in business and he's panicking. Cause he's like, Mikey, I, he's like, I can extend it another six months. It's going to cost this much money, blah, blah, blah. He's like, we got to be in business today. It's like, no sweat, man. I'll be right back. <laughs> you know me, I'm like, brr, coffee. Brr, 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 brr. <laughs> literally email them within, it's literally within an hour. And I'm like, this is a fully functioning, because it's like, look, and it's got to be real. Like this is, this is, you know, you're putting your, your, like this is under oath that you're doing this stuff. And I was like, okay, here's beautiful. This website's full functioning. It works. <laughs> you can actually order on it, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I'm firing my IT guy. <laughs> like, this is, he's like, you built that. Everyone wants to hire And me. I was like, oh, yeah. You know, but like the way we built our system, we make it as easy as possible. Yeah. We listen to our customers. I want to bring that to the show. Mm-hmm. I think that would be especially people coming out. A lot of people want to sell hair. They don't know how. They don't have the funds. It's not, it's not cheap. It's a really great idea. So that you're going to see me there. And you'll see Zakira there as well, because Zakira, make sure you check off the date. On, on, you got to get on Zakira's calendars, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you can just be like, hey, Zakira, this, that. Oh, no, no, no. You got to get way ahead of time. So let's get Zakira on the calendar. We're going to have her there. Um, it's going to be exciting. So when you walk in the show now, is there going to be anything different? Is it going to be easier to find people's booths? Mm. Is we need some easier? live music for the show. Is there going to be something? Oh. Is there going to be something <laughs> that is going to be like, I know from maybe an app or another way, because the website previously had no information, right. you know, mm. like it didn't, oh. it was not his fault, guys. <laughs> <laughs> literally, New Orleans didn't have the address of the show on the homepage. Yep. You couldn't click a little link in a Google map so I could get there. Right. No joke. Yep. I literally want to die. <laughs> Okay. That's pretty extreme. So, <laughs> it was bad. I, it is I'm just saying, like, what what are some of the changes from experience when you're walking in the show for be able to find vendors, re, maybe even reconnect with people that mm. you found there? What what kind of changes? You're probably still on the works of making this stuff happen. What can you share with people? We are, but um, what I can share with you is we, we've we gotten the message loud and clear. We, we got signage wrong in New Orleans, and we got it badly wrong. Now, obviously, there are good off-the-shelf apps for events that will do what we need to do, and we're just making sure that we select the right one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not a big fan of building custom something that's available off the shelf if it's not strategic to us. This isn't strategic to us. This is just something that we need to have. So let's go out and uh, find the right tool and buy it. And our IT team is looking at what our competitors are using, what's out there, what's the best tool for us. On the signage, I think that we are going to first lay the floor out better, Mm -hmm. better grid system, better signage, um, mix of physical and digital signage. I think that we really fell down with not having, I don't think we had any digital signage um, Mm -hmm. at New Orleans and being able to on the fly adjust Hey, look, we've had a cancellation. Hey, we've uh, we can have a scroll. Yeah, we can good. have 
more interesting. We can have updates and we can kind of push and prompt the crowd. Hey, there's something going on in main stage that you want to might want to know about. These booths have classes in progress right now. I think we can do a lot more to push and guide our our attendees toward the most engaging pieces of the floor. And then again, just a cleaner layout, a cleaner flow of traffic. One of the things that really bugged me is we had food at New Orleans, but it was behind booths. So you could be 10 feet away from food and not see it. And mm. I haven't seen, I've gone to a dozen shows since then. I haven't seen another show that's made that mistake. So wow. we're, we're going to get that right. Um, no bathrooms on the floor. That was a miss. You know, we're not going to make that mistake again. Again, getting out of our own way. You know, uh, recognizing with humility what we did wrong and correcting it is 90% of my job. I'll tell you guys why this guy is so successful mm -hmm. is he 100% can admit, it wasn't necessarily a lot of what he's talking about wasn't his doing, but as a company and speaking as a company, admit what was wrong. Yeah. And a lot of times I try to tell people, you know, the reason why in our lives, we're not more successful is we just don't know how. And that usually comes down to education and experience. Yeah. And until you can humbly say, the reason why a private label has six stores and not a hundred, I'm not smart enough. I haven't figured it out yet, right? Until you can honestly say that, it's very difficult for you to, to reach a certain level in business and success. One thing I would like to see at Bronner Brothers in 2024 in Atlanta, because we are so social media, we live through social media, yeah. is some more interactive um, installations of areas to do photos. Yes. So f not say like photo booth, but you have like this extravagant kind of Bronner Like Brothers, an activation. Activations yeah. and things sprinkled out so people can do the photos, posting, build awareness. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's great for Bronner Brothers. Yeah. Are you going to have stuff like that? Absolutely. Um, uh, and again, I don't like to beat this drum overly, but I think it's important. I am going with fresh eyes when I go out and do my competitive intelligence trips. And I'm going with other people to make sure I'm getting the benefit of what they're seeing as well. Not just what am I seeing, what are you seeing? And let's compare notes. And generally we compare notes every night. Um, but what I see is the shows that are the most imposing are doing everything they can to create additional moments of engagement. Here's a selfie station. Here's another, say, hey, look, there's another selfie station. The layout's better. The open air format is more engaging. We have to get away from thinking that Brawner Brothers is a cash and carry flea market. We need to create a festival-like feeling. You're going to learn things here. You're going to reconnect with your colleagues here. You're going to see interesting and exciting stuff. And it's going to be a great opportunity. It's going to be a great experience. You're not going to want to leave. You're going to want to see what's next. You're not going to want to come and spend two hours. You're going to want to come and spend three days. Right. And I think to the extent that we can deliver that, we will have gone a long way towards showing that we're back. We heard the complaints. We heard the perfectly justifiable issues, and we're working on it. I'm not saying we'll close the gap completely, but I think we're going to go a long way to closing the gap. People are going to see a much better Brawner Brothers in uh, April in Atlanta 24. And I think those that have been coming back year after year are going to recognize some of the magic from before. And those that are coming for the first time, they're not going to want to leave. Okay. I, I like that. that. Yeah, me too. Um, I think that there are a lot of people listening who have businesses, not just in the hair industry, but um, businesses across all different industries. So what is one thing that you could share um, that would benefit businesses who are looking to kind of get over the hump and get to that next level, whether it's um, passing a threshold with sales, whether it's getting better with marketing, what is something that you could share? So um, in the limited amount of time when I'm not working, I'm a big fan of military history. And there's a saying in military history that uh, amateurs study battles and experts study logistics. In business, Let's go ahead. Let's run the back one more time. 
<laughs> that was say, a good one. Say it again. That was really good. <laughs> take notes back there, buddy. Come on. It's important. Amateur study battles. Mm-hmm. Battles are big, you know. Oh, 10,000 people fought 10,000 people on this date. And that's how a lot of us learned history. Mm. And don't get me wrong. I, I'm a big fan of history. I enjoy that. But what makes a battle successful is logistics. Mm-hmm. How did I feed those people? And did the other side do as good a job of feeding those people? And if you actually look into a lot of military history, it really did come, come down to who had the bigger, better wagon train. Um, that's a little bit of a sidebar, but it sets up um, my corollary in business. Experts in business focus on cash flow. Mm-hmm. And amateurs focus on sales. Now, you can have high margin business. Mikey talks about sales, not because he's not an expert, but he's doing the translation in his head. But business is cash flow. Mm -hmm. Business is not your top line revenue. That's a vanity stat. How's your cash flow doing? Do you understand your cash flow? I have lost count of the number of clients I have had who hire me after their top sales year because they ran out of money. Yeah. Mm. They would have been better growing slower and banking some cash and building capacity, but they blew it out because, Hey, look, the more sales I make, the more money I make. Right. No, No. (laughs) not not always. So as a, as someone who has advised dozens of businesses across industries, I would say overall, if you can focus on cash flow. You can understand your cash flow dynamics. What makes your cash flow go up? What makes it go down? What's your sweet spot? You are you are eighty percent of the way there. That's really good. I feel like we need a whole masterclass. Just I know. <laughs> we need to just so set up I, a masterclass. You set it up for uh, you're going to be running around running the show at Bronner Brothers. But are you hosting a class at Bronner Brothers? <laughs> I'm not showing up. Right. <laughs> Me and too. I think a lot more people would as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned that in, in in jest, but one of the things that we're talking about with the team, I don't think Bronner Brothers has taken its proper place in terms of thought leadership in this industry. So I'm talking to the team about having a keynote state of the industry talk. And that's really great. I understand that it might not be the most engaging um, talk for uh, especially the beauty school students, but I think it's going to be great content. And I also think it's so important for our industry that more of us invest in thought leadership. At the end of the day, we need to understand our industry. We need to understand what's going on and how it impacts us. There are too many anecdotes. There are too many, this person got rich doing this. Well, wait a minute. How rich? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, is that even accurate? You know, there, there's a lot of rumor. There's a lot of innuendo. There's a lot of information. Not that's as rooted not... in fact as we would like, but there's right. a lot of good facts out there. Mm-hmm. If we would just start gathering, collating them, and sharing them with other, others and interpreting them, this is what this means for you. We are sitting on a massive demographic shift in this country Mm -hmm. and we're not doing enough to exploit it. A lot of people are riding that wave, but they don't even recognize the wave that they're riding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because it starts with the thought leadership, you understanding your craft, understanding what you've mastered. And there's a correlation. I feel like across all industries that need to have that. Um, I was just talking about within the real estate industry Um, There are statistics that come out literally on a daily basis. There are tons of um, thought leaders who think about the way that the market is going, but what are the actual hard facts? And so we have events where it's like, this is the state of the real estate industry for agents, um, realtors, investors, all of the people to understand coming into this industry, what you're getting yourself into. And I think That is so important for the beauty industry because just like uh, Mike and I talked about a while ago when um, COVID happened, like how do you shift during those times? Like what's coming? Like they talk about another pandemic is going to come. What does that look like in the beauty industry? How can you get ahead of that versus waiting until it happens? And then everybody is like, oh no, I'm not selling hair or I'm not doing hair or what are the other things that can be done? So I think that hit the nail on the head, like with the um, state of the beauty industry. I think that is needed, definitely. (laughs) We think so too. 
Yeah, I love that. Um, so we talked about a piece of advice that you can give people who are kind of at that threshold. Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners or viewers um, that could benefit them? So I guess I'm getting to the point where I look old enough that people are starting to ask me for advice. I think it's the gray hair. <laughs> so last night, um, my Uber driver was uh, was a young man, and he asked me uh, some version of this question. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give someone starting out? And I thought about it for a minute. The biggest advantage I've had in my career is I've chosen things that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And at the moment that I chose them, I'm not going to argue that I was the best. I've certainly had some advantages and I've certainly been blessed with a set of skills. But I think- A special set of skills. (laughs) (laughs) But I think the most important thing is if you're engaged in what you're doing, if you love it or at least like it a lot, Mm -hmm. that is going to be a long-term advantage for you. That's going to compound over time. I'm willing to put in an extra hour because I love what I do. And that person doesn't. And eventually the increments by which I'm learning and the pace at which I'm getting better is going to overwhelm everyone else because they don't like it. They're doing it for other reasons. Find something you love or at least like a lot and dive in. And recognize that it's going to take some time, but you have a structural advantage. And use that structural advantage. That's right. great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it comes down to also, I think, and it ties into when people ask me about certain things related to money. Well, money makes the business happen and money's important. You got employees and everything else. But if you're really doing the business just for money, if you really just don't like it, I just don't think you're going to be as successful doing that business. It can't just be for money. Right. You have to really be focused on your client, yeah. creating something special in the industry, innovating. And that when you create that energy, that energy brings money. That's right. Money just is an simple. outcome. You can't just focus on it. Right. hundred percent. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we know that Brown and Brothers is coming up February. Give us a, yeah, yeah. Day, give us a, we need I was dates, about to just say that. Yeah. Location, <laughs> the Google Map coordinates. <laughs> Let's get it all. Google well, I don't have the Google Google Map coordinates. <laughs> They'll but be on the website. They will really be on the website. <laughs> okay. Um, Atlanta, February 24th through the 26th mm-hmm. at the Georgia World Congress Center. We, it is going to be our homecoming. We're so excited to be back. Again, we haven't been in Atlanta since February of 2020. Our, our theme is homecoming. This is going to be an amazing show. We're looking forward to it being engaging. A new look format for Brawner Brothers. The old magic, but a new look. Love it. Ooh. Yes, and we'll put um, the website and social media and everything in the show notes for those of you who want to go grab tickets or purchase a vendor booth and uh, connect with Browner Brothers outside of the podcast. Yeah, one last quick tip for if you're planning on going, mm-hmm. um, this is going to save you a lot of money. So listen, if you're <laughs> planning to go to Browner Brothers and you want to save money do so, doing so, plan ahead. That means get your flight ASAP, Mm -hmm. book your hotel ASAP, get the tickets ASAP, put it on your calendar, make that commitment today. It's going to save you a lot of money. And what do you do with that extra money? Come see me. (laughs) I have a label for that. I got some bundles for you. (laughs) That part. So thank you so much, David, for joining us today. It has been a joy having you on the podcast. I've learned some things. I'm sure Mikey has learned some things. Um, And we've been able to exchange. I'm sure the viewers and the listeners are learning some things. So make sure you guys go back, listen to this podcast. You're probably going to have to pause it in between times. You can take some notes, but do so. But thank you again for um, joining us today. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I would that sound was like great. an awkward exit, so it's always <laughs> nice. <laughs>